cryptocurrency space. I'm your host, Piter, joined as always, thank goodness, by Ozzy. I missed you last week. There's a lot to get Thank you, thank you. You were at Permissionless. How was all that? Did you have a good time? Oh, Permissionless was great. Lots to talk about, and I mean, I can't wait to dive into it. I guess it'll be today on Not Crypto Bros. We're going we're gonna to break it down for everybody. Well, give me just, I didn't prepare you for this at all, but give me your biggest takeaway from it. Industry you to pick one and thing. Insider, and they're waiting on the side for regulatory clarity. They, they're chomping at the bit to get in. All right, cool. All right, there's a lot to get to, so we'll jump right in. As always, please do your own research. This is not financial advice. So the story kind of coming out today, and we're recording Monday, as always, posting on Tuesday. Citigroup made an announcement today with the introduction of their city token services. And their service will utilize blockchain and smart contract technologies to offer institutional clients, which you just mentioned, cross-border payments, liquidity management, and automated trade finance services. This will be a private permission blockchain uh, that is owned and managed by the institution itself. Uh, but they've had some interesting pilot programs. So, so far, City Token Service has been applied to a global cash management pilot program. This initiative empowered clients with the ability to seamlessly tra- transfer liquidity between different city branches on a 24-7 basis. Another noticeable achievement of this service was a successful pilot collaboration with a prominent shipping company. Uh, Maersk. Maersk, yeah, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Together they digitized a solution akin to traditional bank guarantees and letters of credit within the trade finance ecosystem, demonstrated a streamlined process assuring that both buyers and sellers can enjoy instant payment capabilities, basically reducing uh, transaction processing times from several days to just a matter of minutes. I mean, these are both major use cases for the blockchain. Does it suck that it's on a permission private blockchain? Sure. But we, I was listening to the head of Ava Labs, and he said this is where a lot of that is starting off. It's on private permission blockchains are often subnets. Uh, AVAX has apparently been getting a lot of love in that regard of subnets. And once regulatory clarity comes along, they could potentially just turn off the privateness and, and open it up and connect it to the greater ecosystem. So pretty interesting. I mean, these are definitely some of the more basic use cases of blockchain, but it's interesting to see that they're also using them for um, letters of credit so to basically speed up uh, trade deals, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, it's not surprising to see these large money managers and institutions want to have control of the situation as kind of explore it. The fact that it's going to start off centralized makes sense uh, to a certain degree yeah absolutely it's it's interesting to see city group come out they're really trying to stay competitive and stay in the game kind of interesting to see jp morgan and others not coming out with big announcements so this is pretty big move on on city group and it'll be interesting to see if other banks maybe hop on the same blockchain or if they use uh, their own separate blockchains talking about banks and crypto Deutsche Bank um, is starting to hold institutional uh, clients crypto for them uh, in partnership with a Swiss firm, Taurus, to basically provide custody services for institutional clients, cryptocurrencies, and tokenized assets. Um, Yeah, so for the the first time, they'll be able to hold a limited number of cryptocurrencies for the clients, as well as tokenized versions of the traditional finance assets. And we're hearing more and more of the uh, tokenized or the tokenization of real world assets. So both the Citigroup, Deutsche Bank, kind of what you mentioned about AVAX, a narrative we expect to see kind of in this next bull market. Oh yeah, tokenized real world assets are a huge thing. There was a lot of talks at Permissionless about them. And I believe that they will be a major narrative going into this next bull run. Now we have um, Deutsche Bank joining other large banks, including Standard Chartered, BNB Mellon, and Society General uh, offering custody services. And we have some quotes here from, what is this, Paul Mal- 
Mali, who's the global head of security services, he kind of says that the digital asset space is expected to encompass trillions of dollars of assets, and it's bound to be seen as a priority for investors and uh, corporations alike. And he tips his hat to regulators saying that Deutsche Bank is proceeding cautiously and in line with the spirit and the letter uh, regulations governing the asset class. Deutsche Bank is based in Europe, and therefore they do have MICA, which gives them some of that clarity that we don't have in the U.S. right now. There's basically a, a design to ensure that it doesn't contaminate the bank's other activities. Uh, Paul Molly. So this is all uh, an interesting development from uh, Deutsche Bank. Yeah, just another big bank getting into the game. Kind of continuing on this theme of real world assets, you mentioned uh, Avalanche early. Um, and this happened a month ago. It kind of slipped under my radar, but the Avalanche Foundation launched a Vista incentive program that intends to grow the tokenized asset sector on their blockchain. So they intend to accelerate the growth of tokenization by allocating $50 million to purchase assets minted on Avalanche that include different asset classes such as bonds, stocks, credits, commodities, real estate. Um, many traditional institutions, bank, such as Bank of America, BlackRock, have recognized the potential of asset tokenization on the blockchain, um, hinting that this niche will not be a niche and it will grow tremendously. We have the Boston Consulting Group predicting that this sector will reach $16 trillion by 2030. Um, and we're talking about a $1 trillion total cryptocurrency market right now. So Absolutely. It's kind of crazy. A, a big, and this, this story that I read about, I gave an interesting example. So an example of the benefits of tokenization can be seen with fractionalized asset. So if, if an asset was tokenized, it could be fractionalized allowing the creation of a new market from the original one. So the example they give is, let's say, a really famous painting like Picasso. If you can fractionalize it to cryptographic tokens, you could have many small owners of the artwork rather than a single tycoon. I thought that was an interesting example. Token up, being able to tokenize assets gives you the ability to fractionalize them, which basically opens up a whole world of possibilities in terms of what could happen with the space and and just how big that space could grow i mean there's tons of uh tokenized house pro uh, housing projects that are out there right now mm -hmm. and i met several more at permissionless and they're all small yeah, that was that was the other big example that comes to mind once you read fractionalizations like oh you can own a part you can't afford a whole property or land or afford to develop it but maybe you can get be a part of a project and so this is one huge use case that a lot of people have jumped on and there's a lot of small projects and it's kind of an interesting thing is because of the decentralized nature of the blockchain all of these small projects can exist and coexist without necessarily having to compete with one another uh yeah and seeing the I guess the dichotomy between these you have like the big banks and you have Citibank and their own kind of private blockchain and then you have avalanche attempting in a more decentralized way now they do have subnets and like you mentioned people can develop on the subnet and potentially go from centralized to centralized or from centralized to decentralized yeah exactly it, it definitely provides a lot of aperture for all players of all sizes in the game and Thinking about new players entering the game, Japan is starting to allow startups to raise funds by issuing crypto instead of stocks. And this kind of major is it, it allows crypto fundraising as a means of fundraising and global fundraising uh, in the future. This is something that, you know, a lot of people have said, oh, yeah, cryptos could totally just replace stocks. And... Mm -hmm. This is a way of allowing that to happen. And Japan is stepping up to do this, which is really interesting because they're lagging behind the rest of the world in terms of embracing uh, digital assets up until now. And so this is a major. They've also sought to amend the tax code, uh, exempting local businesses from the year end unrealized gain tax on cryptocurrencies. So basically taxing you on gains that you haven't yet made uh, 
on crypto. So that's massive. And we're specifically seeing this be applied to uh, category funds known as investment business limited partnerships. So hopefully this will help boost Japan's role in digital assets and maybe help see startup and crypto fundraising as the way of the future. And some, some potential regulatory clarity that allows small investors to get involved with startups. That was one of the cool things about DeFi um, was that you could be a angel or a seed investor and be a regular, you know, not have a lot and still get involved in these ideas very early on. So to see this kind of regulatory clarity that may potentially allow it is yeah, bullish to me. Very bullish, but we've got to turn to some more bearish news now. Uh, looking at kind of recent news, Binance.us, their CEO, Brian Schroeder, has resigned amid news that the company would lay off another 100 st uh, staff members. Uh, it's the second round of layoffs this year, and it's about a third of their workforce. Binance.us is very much downsizing. This is... They've, they've had more than one resignation or kind of people leaving the company, it seems like, just in general. A lot of the exec team, either from Binance US or Binance Global, have left. We're, yeah. we're seeing lots of FUD and Binance FUD around everything uh, from SEC filing charges against various uh, Binance entities, um, including their <sighs> founder, and the CFTC, uh, CZ, and other entities linked with Binance for evading U.S. law. So we're seeing some pretty big attacks on Binance. Uh, Binance really does seem to be on the brink, according to many. Funnily enough, when we were walking around permissionless, one, one person that we met and many others that we met afterwards were all asking us what our thoughts on Binance were. And the general narrative is Binance is done uh, and that they're screwed. So it's pretty interesting to see uh, what that means and what's going on there. The, uh, the next potential black swan event for this bear market. I mean, there's a lot of ecosystem running on BNB chain and still a lot of global yeah. trade in terms of trading volume being done on Binance. So Binance collapsing could have some pretty major effects globally. And you'll see our meme of the day is bears meeting September and wondering, oh, what's happening? We haven't really had that big dump that everyone was expecting, but yeah, we've had a bit of a rally, even a little bit. I, I, I don't. I hesitate to call this a rally, but what if Binance collapsing is is that news that we're waiting that we're waiting on to really see that one last flush of the market? Yeah, Binance collapsing, a little, a little more selling from the U.S. government, a little bit of this FTX selling that where the court just approved potentially yeah ftx had had the court approved them selling billions in bitcoin ethereum and solana which is you know not great for the market i mean it's not a huge volume of money but it's additional sell pressure that no one really wants on that no one will really want on the market right now like there's not a lot of volume people are kind of worried mm -hmm. the biggest one that'll get punished is solana for sure uh bitcoin and ethereum considering the the total volume uh and the total cap they're they're much smaller but solana is definitely looking like they're going to take a pounding matic and xrp ton aptos and doge are all targets in, in this potential uh, we could see some stablecoin stump, but unless there's anything to be worried about, I uh, I doubt that we see a stablecoin depeg uh, these stablecoin changes. Yeah, I've, there's some interesting little notes in this. So, like, their biggest holding is Solana, but I was a lot of it's locked up. You're basically, if you were to buy the Solana, you'd be buying their vesting. It's not necessarily 
mean a huge thing, right? Um, and then there's another stipulation about a um, hundred million a week that they can sell. So putting a little bit of a damper on this 3.4 billion number, if they can't sell that much of it, you're not going to dump on it right away. And then the, their second largest holding was this FTT token. Who's going to buy that? No one. <laughs> yeah, so it's like I don't see how that is that scary. But then you get to the next. The next three biggest is Bitcoin at two hundred and fifty million ish, a little higher. Uh, Ethereum at ninety million, and Aptos at sixty seven. So comparing Aptos and sixty seven million in Aptos of a one point two billion dollar market cap is about five percent. You know, you start getting down into here like Aptos, uh, maybe bit or tong coin it could have an effect but compare that to the 250 million of btc it's a larger number but it's a 530 billion dollar market cap so it's a half of a tenth of a percent it's it's a so, much smaller amount which is why i'm thinking some of these smaller tokens that they hold in terms of xrp ton bit matic doge and aptos are those yeah. that are potentially a little bit more at risk of seeing some negative price action over the next little while because their, their holdings do represent a little bit more for the people who are in bankruptcy they might want to get on selling some of that ton coin that had a pretty big rally i think recently but we can kind of jump into a little bit of the macro news yeah we had cpi and ppi yeah we had cpi and ppi print last week and we got a fed meeting this wednesday although i've never seen it at 99 percent no change <laughs> Or just ninety nine percent anything. Um, so uh, we've seen, we've had some some of this kind of certainty before, but it's but always ninety nine. I swear, it's like ninety point nine percent. I mean, it is high. It's as high as it gets. It's more about what's going to happen. It's really. Well, it's it's about some. T- it's about what's what's he going to say? Um, yeah, that might move it. Yeah, that because November numbers November numbers suggest yeah. that at least 33, 34% of people are expecting a quarter basis point hike from there. Um, right. So is, is that percentage going to go up after the talk, basically? Right? Yeah. Go down. Like, how's that number going to move? Exactly. And how do projections into next year change? Um, right. Right now, projections into even as far as May uh, of next year are fairly conservative. I would say we've got... 60, 60 some odd, uh, 64% or 62% thing, you know, either it stays the same or it's up a quarter basis point from where it is now with only about 35% uh, or 36% expecting it to be between a quarter basis point and half a basis point down from where it is now. So that's a pretty conservative estimate compared to what we've seen in the past. So yeah. uh, it, it's interesting to see how this might affect the numbers. We're even seeing, as far as July, even, the numbers are still looking pretty conservative or more conservative than they have been uh, up until recently. So how does Jerome Powell's talks in, uh, after the, the announcement on Wednesday uh, impact this? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot can change. We're a year, I mean, we're almost a year away from when the market is at like 50% thinking we're going to start cuts. You know, which was not the case. You talk about it. Oh no! They were they were expecting, you know, a pivot early in the year, end of this year. You know. Oh, we were talking and, months ago. We only a few months ago we were talking about a pivot in November. So. Right. <laughs> so that seems to be off the table at the moment. <laughs> well, what did you see in the CPI and PPI numbers that came out? It looked like inflation came in a little bit hot. It came in hot, but it didn't come in hot. It's a really interesting uh, question to look at. We were above last uh, on CPI, but core CPI and core CPI did rise above expectation as well. But overall, the year-to-year core CPI number came down, uh, which was in line with what was expected. So, and, and it seemed like to start all this, that was the stickiest number of all. Corsi had been very Vicky. Uh, yeah. The fact that it is coming down year over year is yeah. positive, and probably why we haven't we didn't have a huge uh, reaction from it uh, with mm-hmm. these CPI numbers. And the other important part is that core CPI didn't nearly jump or or, or behave as erratically as CPI itself. CPI which 
really contains the two more volatile uh, food category, uh, categories, which are food and energy. Those are the reason why CPI was as high as it was. CPI was really heavily driven by jumps in energy costs, uh, mainly due to people using their AC a lot more in the summer, uh, mm. price of gas jumping up and oil. So kind of two things uh, that kind of have impacted CPI. But it'll be interesting to see how j talks about CPI because core CPI is still 4.3% year over year, even though it right. fell by 0.4 um, since July doesn't really mean that that number is still not very good. You want core core CPI year over year to be, ideally, they want that to be coming close. Um, 2% is their number, but I know that they're aiming to try to get closer to 3% before the end of the year. So this is not exactly an ideal result. And how are they going to look at energy costs and how energy costs are driving both CPI and PPI. PPI had its biggest uh, seasonally uh, increase since June of 2022, and it was much higher than the, the estimate of 0.4%, but right, yeah. again, also driven by oil and energy. So hmm. do we do we see j Powell kind of write off this these oil and energy increases as not really being impacted by their interest rates and saying they can keep the path or do they look core is too high do we do we need to still act and so that'll be interesting to see uh we're waiting for j Powell's thoughts on wednesday and we uh unemployment numbers actually come in a little bit lower than expected 220 or then uh, 225,000. So that's an interesting number, but we're still forecasting that that number is probably going to be 25 uh, this Thursday. It probably isn't going to be that big market mover uh, right now. I think people are expecting these numbers to remain relatively stable, but every every week, but kind of stay at that 225,000. Looking at housing starts is the only other thing that we've got between now and uh, the Fed rate decision. So we'll see if we see an uptick in housing starts on building permits. But given it's August, I, I expect we maybe see a slight decrease. Well, there's no doubt that inflation has been a huge burden on and that there's been kind of some new talk about not stable coins. Um, so we have CEO Brian Armstrong saying he believes flat coins are the next iterable stable coins. Um, and basically flat coins are designed to move in line with inflation instead of being pegged to like the dollar or a specific currency. Somehow they can match with inflation. So you can keep your value um, with these coins. But they're very new. Um, and it's hard for they're me not to as, imagine. They're not as would... new as you think a lot of people were talk about permission talking lists. about them, but I don't see them a lot in use, I They're guess. not in I use mean... right now. A lot of them are being built either as yield-bearing stable coins or as true flat coins like Brian Arms. Uh, there's quite a number. And I, I've seen some very interesting ones being built on Ledger. On X. Um, mm. I've seen some that are being built on all different kind of platforms, some using mortgages, using uh, gold mines, a whole variety of different means of trying to buy uh, these flat coins. And super interesting, lots of projects out there doing it. Yeah, so I guess developers try to use the consumer price index, which is a public cost of living index or a proprietary cost of living index like Trueflation to calculate the value of a flat coin. Um, but yeah, exactly how that works is a, a little bit beyond me. But as with any coin in crypto, there are challenges. The flat coin creator must hold enough assets to compensate for the losses incurred when investors pull out funds or assets or when assets depreciate. It's that um, there's a possibility that regulators prohibit non-fiat back stable coins, meaning flat coins in the future could face hurdles just from regulators. Oh, there, there's already hurdles. The only regulated stable coins 
are in New York right now and those require a one-to-one -one backing in US dollar or US dollars. Uh, I, I talked to several projects about how they're planning to overcome that or if they're not, uh, some of them had different answers. I, I definitely would be interested in talking to more Flatcoin projects. I, I've actually written up a little uh, proposal for one myself. Uh, I think that some of these regulatory issues are super important to take into consideration, especially uh, the hurdle of being either non not fiat backed or being fiat backed, but you, you hit uh, your peg. And the other issue I could see with it, and maybe it's just for me personally, but just the complexity of how these coins work. And they all are different. Uh, it's kind of novel. Uh, even though you said they've been developing for a while, they all seem to have their own system for how they create this flat coin absolutely so just understanding how they work and people feeling confident that they will work seems to be a hurdle as well absolutely that is a huge piece and there's a lot of things to be learned and explored on how it kind of reminds me of a little bit of like algorithmic stable coins kind of like a naughty word that with, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't Luna i wouldn't use like that. that because some of them could be considered algorithmic depending on how you do your backing. It really, it really depends on how you're backing the stable coin or your flat coin. And I think they don't necessarily need to be called algorithmic because I don't think necessarily they are. Yeah. Um, we have a story out of Coinbase. Um, he, this is, we kind of started this story because CEO and, but, um, Coinbase has announced that they're going to integrate the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Now, they came out in August and said they're going to look into it, and they still haven't created it. Um, and we even have a quote saying, like, this will take time. Please be patient. But uh, the crypto exchange Coinbase has confirmed its decision to integrate the Layer 2 payment protocol Lightning Network as users seek faster and cheaper Bitcoin transit. Um, joining Binance, which on July 17th announced the complete work. Um, now this, a, a while back, people were talking about like, why isn't Lightning Network being incorporated into exchanges, both centralized and decentralized exchanges, which was a fair critique of it. Like scale out, when are the, when are the, the scalability has been one of Bitcoin's major pain points. Many cryptocurrency exchanges uh, are now exploring the potential of Lightning Network. So it's nice to see this adoption and faster and cheaper Bitcoin to compete with basically all these altcoins. I mean, essentially. Oh, absolutely. You need this with Bitcoin or else you're in trouble. People don't want to be paying massive gas fees. It's expected. And if you want people to use Bitcoin as a store of value, you, they need to be able to get it into their cold storage effectively and quickly without incurring massive costs. So Yeah, it makes it a little bit harder to invest if there's these high transaction fees involved because you have to overcome for that percentage in order to make any money. Exactly. And with that, talking about altcoins, Polygon has released their proposals for the 2.0 upgrade and the poll token migration. So they've published three proposals to help implement the Polygon 2.0 upgrade. PIP 17, which outlines phase zero of Polygon 2.0, which is the primary aspect of this proposal. Basically, that it's going to ensure that no action will be required from end users and developers using Polygon's existing proof of stake system and their ZK EVM chains during the upgrade. The other one is a PIP 18 is to implement the poll token, uh, which is basically intended to replace the existing Matic tokens as the native gas and staking asset of the Polygon ecosystem, and PIP19, which calls for upgrading the native gas token on the Polygon proof of stake from Matic to Polygon, uh, or Pole, in a manner that ensures maximum backward compa compatibility and so that it doesn't necessarily alter smart contracts on the Polygon proof of stake ecosystem uh, in terms of compa compatibility. So it's basically to ensure that everything remains the same while moving to this new token. Yeah, it's nice to see they're taking like a careful approach to it. We're making these proposals, but we want to make sure everything works that's already been developed. So it's nice to see. Uh, hopefully this can go smoothly if they go forward with it. Yeah, 
Exactly. Hopefully everything does go smoothly. I'm sure that these proposals will probably be approved and this could be a, ma a massive move for Polygon, especially as a layer two. And as we see the CK EVM and layer two ecosystem really explode in this next bull market. I mean, basically it's almost like you want to hear not much about it if it's going smoothly. Kind of like an offensive lineman in football. Like no news is good news when it comes to upgrades. And, exactly. You, you, you don't necessarily, you want to hear that it's approved. You want to hear that it's done. You don't really want to hear about anything while it's happening because something happening really while it's happening is bad. <laughs> I like their cheap gas. I like using Polygon when it's, when it's available. Absolutely. So we want to thank everybody for listening to Decentralized News. If you are not subscribed to the show yet, please consider subscribing to catch our videos as soon as they drop. Our goal is to provide unfiltered content that will help foster genuine discussions to help the entire space grow. Uh, please remember, we are not financial advisors, and this is not financial advice. This show was presented for educational and entertainment purposes only. Please do your own research before making any investment decisions. Thanks for your support, and stay tuned for our next episode.